Okay. Great. Well, Professor, thanks for your time. First of all, thanks for, for seeing me. I'm really, uh, I'm really excited and nervous for, 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 for this, but um, I'm glad. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad we finally made it, uh, made it happen. Uh, so um, I, I, I would just have to, uh, I would like to ask a few questions. Uh, are, are you listening all right here? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so the, the, the idea uh, was for us to meet with the whole society, but uh, because of the schedule and, and, and other matters, look, we can just chat here. So um, uh, I'll send them the, the video later and I'll send them your regards, okay? okay. Right, so let me, uh, I wrote down some questions so we can have the, the, the conversation, all right? So the, my, my first question for you uh, is about your academic trajectory, okay? So, uh, I would like to hear a little bit about what key attitudes and strategies uh, do you think an intellectual has to develop across the years to make good progress, to make substantial progress on his field? So, uh, and, and personally speaking, how have you managed to stay motivated and focused on your work uh, across these years? Well, the only strategy I know is to find what you're interested in, what you find challenging and exciting and pursue it as best you can. My own personal trajectory is pretty chaotic. I never, <laughs> I never really had, I mean, I have formal degrees, but I never met the qualifications for any of them. When I was an undergraduate, I took almost no courses, it took a couple of graduate courses for which I wasn't prepared, but the instructor was willing to let me in. At graduate school, I, I was essentially off on my own. Uh, got a PhD kind of by accident, <laughs> but, it, you know, but never did it. You know, I just handed in some work I was doing, essentially. But I, I, had, I was very lucky. I had uh, very outstanding people in the field who were let, willing to just let me go on my own way. So it worked fine. <laughs> amazing, amazing. That sounds, you make it sound like a, a very, very easy. I suppose uh, uh, you, you, I suppose you have found uh, a deep love for, for, for the work and, uh, and, and you followed your, your intuition, your, your, your curiosities. Basically, I mean, in the early, when I was an undergraduate uh, for the first couple of years, I assumed that I was working with uh, Zelig Harris, leading professor and leading fi figure in theoretical linguistics, very impressive person. I was also taking courses with Nelson Goodman, outstanding philosopher. We stayed worked together for many, I stayed working with him for many years. And the first couple of years, I more or less took for granted what seemed to be the right way to do things, what was being in the um, you know, the new work that was coming out, and faculty members who I greatly respected, I assume they must know what they're doing. On the side, I was kind of working with my own hobbies, which I just seemed to be something interesting to do, so I pursued them. And gradually over the years, the balance shifted. The hobbies got more interesting. I saw more problems with the way work was being done and just moved over to the hobbies. Amazing. Actually, I've written about it if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. So um, on, on, on this on this note, on the on the matter of 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 intellectual research and inquiry, um, I read a letter you wrote on intellectuals in, in 1967. Um, as, as news about human rights abuse came back to America about the Vietnam War, you wrote an essay uh, called The Responsibility of Intellectuals. And in this essay, you mentioned that intellectuals were, uh, in a way, uh, largely subvenient to power. Uh, I was very interested on, on this idea, uh, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on, on this and, and comment on it uh, in this day and age. Well, if you look over the history of intellectuals, that's pretty much the story. We can go back to classical Greece and ask yourself, uh, who drank the hemlock? Mm. It was the man who was corrupting the youth of Athens by 
asking too many questions, not the ones who are following acceptable procedure. Has that ever changed? Uh, the term intellectual uh, came into its modern use uh, at the time of the Dreyfus trial. Uh, the, uh, the Dreyfusards uh, were called intellectuals in the modern sense, kind of dissident intellectuals. How are they treated? Bitterly, harshly, harshly condemned. The uh, immortals of the Académie Française, you know, denounced them. How can you writers and artists dare to criticize our magnificent institutions, uh, the government, the state, the army, and so on? In fact, Emil Zola was forced to flee for France, in fact. I mean, later, it's the Dreyfus Arts who are honored, not at the time. And I think that's the general pattern. It's hard to find an exception. So let's come up to this time that this article was written, 1967. Yeah, uh, on the Vietnam War. War. Uh, it's very hard to organize. Even protest at that time was just be barely beginning to that point. There were critics of the war. Uh, but George Bundy, who was the national security advisor for Kennedy and Johnson, former dean at Harvard, then head of the Ford Foundation, uh, wrote an article in Foreign Affairs where he talked about the war and he said there's a lot of problems with it. There's a lot of legitimate criticisms. Uh, we got the tactics wrong. We didn't understand this and that and so on. All of that's legitimate. We should pay attention to it. And then he said there are the wild men in the wings uh, who not only question our tactics, but actually question our motives mm -hmm. and look into planning and things like that. There are, of course, crazy lunatics. We're a free society, so we don't put them in the gulag, but we can dismiss them. Uh, they're the critical intellectuals, the ones who follow the, follow the rules. And it goes right to the present. Yeah, definitely. I, I completely agree with you. And 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 I, and 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 thinking about this, I, I remember um, uh, as I was a graduate student in uh, studying philosophy, I read well not graduate undergraduate students studying philosophy. I read uh, a famous essay uh, by Kant by Manuel Kant on the Enlightenment, right? And and on the first few paragraphs, he defines uh, Enlightenment as being. Uh, the the self release the, the release of our self imposed shackles in a way right and he was meaning of course uh, of shackles of, of religion of, of dogma in, in some ways uh, do you think um, I mean on, on this note how how could intellectuals uh, widespread intellectuals not only a, a select few could be released from these shackles in a way because uh, in the end intellectuals in one way or the other, they belong to a, an academic department or a university. And, uh, and how could this uh, work? How could this uh, freedom of, of, I don't know how to put it. You, you know what I mean? The only way is to do it. Um, it's, it's a question everywhere. Um, not much in the sciences, but even there. So for example, uh, um, you know, there are famous cases even in recent times when leading physicists were almost shut out of the profession because of their unorthodox views. David Bohm's a famous case. Later later years, his views became more acceptable. Uh, some just dropped out of the field. They'd forgotten his name. But the, uh, the physicist who first proposed the concept of multiverses, mm -hmm. which is now not uncommon, yeah. uh, he actually just left the field because of uh, of the way he was treated and protests and crazy man and so on. So it does exist in the sciences, but it's marginal. And the sciences mostly the, you know, at least in the advanced sciences, there's a fairly solid basis of understanding that people assume you just have to have and you're not participating in the field. And that's accepted. You know, you go to a quantum theory conference, which I've done, and there's debates and discussions, but fundamentally agreement over a very wide range 
because it's solidly established, it wouldn't make sense to question it. Somebody might come along and say, look, let's look at things in a totally different way, but they wouldn't be ordinary, just laughed at. But as you move to the fields with both less solid substance and more pertinence to human affairs, the two tend to go together, uh, then it changes. The closer you are to dealing with human affairs, the harder it is to break ranks because there's so many pressures forcing things in one direction. It's not impossible. There are people who do it. Uh, you can survive, many don't. And you can be subjected to unpleasant treatment in many ways, uh, vilification, denunciation, uh, sometimes worse, uh, loss of career. There are such people, but it's uh, the universe. The academic field remains reasonably open by comparative standards. You have a fair degree of freedom as compared with other institutional settings in this or other societies. Not perfect by any means, but there are possibilities. Okay. And in fact, in recent years, it's, it's kind of improved, I think. So a lot of things that were very difficult in the 60s, 70s, have now become much freer and more open. A lot of battles were won by activism, and including dissenting intellectuals. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so ch changing subjects a little bit, uh, going into on your latest book, uh, the, the Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal. So uh, you explore and shed light on probably the, the greatest catastrophe of our times, one of the greatest dangers, right? And, and one of the premises uh, is that all the countries uh, have to be in this together, you know, like everyone together, of course. Uh, but the problem uh, that you actually state uh, that on, uh, about underdeveloped countries is that uh, we do not have the means to make the proper investments to, to make this work. And one of your proposals, um, together with your co-author, is that uh, the high-income countries should be the ones to pay for these investments on the low-income countries. Uh, could you elaborate on this idea and, and perhaps uh, say say a bit about how we could make something like this happen? Because after all, MindShop, our, our knowledge society, is, is from Latin America. So as people from, uh, from, from this side of the world, we would like to, to understand how we can, we can support this. Well, there are several kinds of answers. One is survival. Uh, if the less developed world does not participate, we're all dead. That's where maybe up to half the emissions are going to be come from. So they have to participate. Second is moral. We're rich. They're less rich. We have a common task. Therefore, we should participate. The third is history. Why are we rich and they're poor? Well, there's a history. I don't have to run through it. You mentioned Kant and the Enlightenment. It's a great essay. There's other sides to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was the period of conquest. It's the period in which Europe conquered the world by violence, mostly by violence, and carried out horrendous atrocities, shocking atrocities. By now, Europe includes its offshoots the United States, which leads the former Europe, the Western world. So take the United States and Latin America. I mean, why is Latin America less developed than the United States? Well, partly because of the heavy hand of the United States. Yeah. That's very explicit. It's not just, I mean, sometimes it's extreme violence, like simply violently overthrowing the government. Uh, Guatemala, Chile, supporting military coups, uh, plague of repression in Latin America since from the 60s through the 80s, mainly US black. Sometimes it's direct policy. So for example, in 1945, when the US was essentially poised to replace Britain's role as leading international force to sort of take over the world, mm -hmm. the US planners were quite sophisticated, careful. They, 
plan different regions of the world, what their function was and so on. When it got to Latin America, it was simply taken for granted that we don't have to, this is what Henry Stimson, Secretary of War called our little region over here, which has never bothered anyone. So there can't be any other regional alliances because we want a world that's opened our penetration. But our little region over here will set aside, we'll just take care of it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, if you look back in February 1945, uh, the United States called a meeting of Latin American leaders, all the countries in Mexico, Chapultepec, Chapultepec, Mexico. And the purpose of the meeting was to establish what was called an economic charter for the Americas, which the US was laying down. The economic charter is worth reading and even the State Department uh, explanations in the background. The goal, as the State Department put it, was to end economic nationalism in all its forms. Uh, they said there's a disease spreading through Latin America. They called it the philosophy of the new nationalism. Mm. Philosophy of the new nationalism is the idea, I'm quoting now, that the first beneficiaries of a country's resources should be the people of that country. That's heresy. Sound economics, so-called, tells us that the first beneficiaries should be those who can use it most efficiently, which is, of course, us. Our big multinationals can use it much more efficiently than those stupid, ignorant, backward peasants down in the South. So just for reasons of pure efficiency, you know, yeah. benign love for mankind, uh, we have to have we have to be the first beneficiaries. Now they also said that there's this equally heretical idea that in, the, in Latin America that policies should be oriented towards leading to uh, equality of um, and the distribution of resource to people who need them. That's not sound economics. Now, sound economics means maximize efficiency make sure the markets work properly, which means we ought to take everything because we can use it more efficiently. They didn't put it quite in those words before I was quoting. Uh, so the, in particular cases, they said, say Brazil, most powerful country in the South, they can, yeah. they can produce steel, steel, that's okay, but they shouldn't have excessive production. In other words, they shouldn't produce high quality steel, which we can produce better they should produce low quality steel, the kind we're not that much interested in. Uh, well, these were the general attitudes and they're implemented. They're implemented step after step, in the, in the, by, by the way. That's why Latin America is one of the reasons why Latin America is poor. There's indigenous internal reasons as well, in, which are worth looking at, very important. But there's also external reasons. And we have a lot to do with it. Even the internal reasons we have a lot to do with. So one of the deep problems of Latin America, pretty general across the continent, is that uh, Latin American elites have no responsibility for their country. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have to pay taxes. Uh, yeah. you know, they can send their capital abroad, you know, buy a home in the Riviera, send their kids to Harvard and Oxford. They're not concerned with the country. It's very different from East Asian elites. Yeah. They are responsible for the country. No capital export during the period of development. Uh, have to targeted investment domestically, policies of development and so on. That's why East Asia developed, Latin America didn't. Latin America is much better poised for development than East Asia. There's much more resources, no external enemies, but it, the culture was wrong. Now, why are elites allowed to be irresponsible in Latin America? Because every time there's an attempt to create a more democratic society, the US came in and crushed it, case after case. Don't have to run through the history for you. So the final answer to that is, it's our responsibility. 
take a look at Europe and Africa, same story. Middle East, mostly Europe in that case. Yes, uh, your France and England carved up the Middle East for their interests, not for the interests of the people there. Well, now Europe whines when refugees flee from the countries that they've destroyed. Wow. And we whine when people flee from the countries we've destroyed. It's a very ugly picture. I have to agree with Pope Francis that the so-called refugee crisis is a moral crisis for the West. And getting back to your question, there's a lot of reasons why the West should be funding the uh, less developed world in dealing with the problems of uh, polluting the and heating the atmosphere. Very powerful reasons. And it's not being done. In fact, it's worse than that. Let's take the immediate crisis. Yeah. Not as serious as global warming, but the immediate one, the pandemic. Yeah. There's vaccines. No vaccines have been distributed in places like Africa. Why? Because the West has the money. So they're purchasing the vaccines. Uh, Canada, which is supposed to be a more or less humane country by comparative standards, uh, reportedly now has vaccines of, that are about five times as much as they need for their own population. Meanwhile, in Africa, they don't have any. There is a there is an international organization, COFAX, which uh, is supposed to deal with distributional problems. Uh, Trump pulled out of it. I imagine Biden will probably go back into it. But even at COFAX, where they're trying to deal with them, they just can't get the rich countries to agree. They buy up vaccines for themselves. Well, that's a large part of history, one part of the Enlightenment. Yeah, definitely. Like a, the, the legacy in some way, the, what, what was happening during the, during that time. Yes, these are, are, are very complex problems uh, to, get, to get away from very pretty ugly pictures. But I, I actually don't think they're very complex. I think they're very simple. Mm -hmm. What's complex is trying to get people of privilege to do what they ought to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, to, to get out of them, that's what I, I meant. <laughs> the problems are straightforward. The, the solutions are, are in a way, uh, to getting people to do what they, what they ought to do. Uh, the moral um, capacity on, on that side. So uh, uh, changing a little bit on, 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 on a different subject that we, we also spoke briefly on, on, on emails. Um, so perhaps this is not a, well, it is an existential threat in some way, but definitely um, it's, it's kind of a new one. Uh, I'm talking about the, the concept of surveillance capitalism, of, of, of the threat of, of big data AI. And uh, I, I would like to, to ask you about the role of technology in shaping the world and, and, and how could we instead uh, make an effort to, to shape better technology that, that doesn't uh, invade so much human rights. So the, the obvious way would be, I mean, uh, to, to stop using some of these systems, but that, that's not really an option. Uh, what, what can people do against such uh, powerful corporations in, in, in the sense of, of technology? you know, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, and the, the next technologies to, to come? Well, I think it's not so much a matter of technology as the matter of who uses it and how they use it. So technology by and large tends to be fairly neutral. You can use it for harm, you can use it for benefit. Uh, question is who has their hands on the lever? So you take a look at the Snowden revolutions, which are quite interesting. I mean, the ones that reached, received most attention were that, uh, uh, that the NSA was spying on Americans, picking up our communications, shouldn't be doing that. And laws were passed, which presumably constrained that. So it's claimed probably not much. It was doing other things too. The NSA was uh, picking up uh, private email conversations of foreign leaders. That actually led to a couple of international crises. 
with uh, Angela Merkel in Germany and Dilma Rousseff in Brazil. Brazil. Uh, it was doing more than that. So there's now a big campaign in the United States to try to prevent Chinese uh, economic and technological development. A lot to say about that. But one of the aspects of it is to try to destroy Huawei, the main uh, the, the main player on, on tech information systems corp, uh, corporation uh, in operation in, in China. And the claim is uh, it's dangerous to use them because they might have hidden devices which will pick up secrets in the countries where they're used, which is possible. Uh, intelligence has worked very hard on that in many countries and can't find anything, but maybe they miss something. What about American technology? Should anybody use Microsoft or Apple? Are they doing anything like that? Be pretty surprising if they're not. Definitely. In fact, one of the Snowden revelations was that the CIA had managed to penetrate Huawei and was using uh, the was using Huawei technology by their penetration to try to learn about the countries which were using Huawei. Huawei wasn't doing the uh, surveillance the CIA was through Huawei equipment in Iran, Venezuela, other countries. And that was part of the Snowden revelations too. Yes, all of this stuff is going on, should be curtailed, but it's a matter of controlling those with power. And uh, it's not just the governments. The major tech corporations are collecting tons of information about you every minute. Yes. If you have a cell phone, they're tracing you wherever you are. You're driving a car, the car manufacturers are picking up a ton of information. If we ever move to the so-called internet of things, uh, your refrigerator will be picking up information about you, going straight to the big tech companies to use as they want for commercial purposes and also for control. Definitely. Uh, so is that the world we want to live in? Oh, you want to see what it's like? Take a look at China, Definitely. which has moved to the extreme. Uh, they have very, there are not everywhere, but there are cities in China, which the most advanced or backward in these respects, depending on the way you want to look at it, where surveillance is very tight. Um, people have uh, what are called credits. And if you do something wrong, your credit rating goes down. If you do something right, it goes up. You're under constant surveillance and control. That's a world you can imagine. We might be moving there, but it's our choice. Yes, th this is actually my, my, my main interest in, 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 in philosophy, uh, more precisely in the ethics, the ethics of technology, uh, you know, ethics of, of science and technology. And, uh, and I'm afraid we're, we're already moving in, in that direction in, in so many ways. But uh, the, and, and, and what worries me the most is that uh, the machine learning and big data are technologies that are precursors to what's coming uh, next, which is artificial intelligence. Um, I'm not talking about specifically our general artificial intelligence. I'm talking about, about a weak or, or soft artificial intelligence. But they will be uh, very powerful uh, tools. I think there's going to be a level of power that we haven't seen before. And uh, just last week, well, a few days ago, The Guardian uh, uh, published an article about the, the Congress, the US Congress, uh, about talking about developing artificial intelligence weapons and that they actually have a moral imperative to develop these weapons. Uh, and they claim that this is because they uh, would be more precise and hurt less civilians but there's people that are skeptics on this and because of the again the, the word efficiency because they have to do take decisions quickly people might be in danger uh, uh what do you think about uh have, have you um read about this have, have you uh Very dangerous. thought about this i'm the most dangerous at all which might be totally species suicide is automating the systems for detecting potential missile attacks. I mean, we know from the record that the automated systems that we have have failed over and over 
By failed, it means giving false positives. False positives. That is, detected missile attacks that weren't taking place. And human intervention, sometimes at the last minute virtually, managed to save us. Um, there's striking cases of this. But, uh, and if it all gets automated, the more it gets automated, the more dangerous it is. Uh, there's no way to automate sensible decisions. What you can do is, I mean, what soft AI basically does is find patterns. Huge, huge, huge amounts of data, uh, very rapid computing, see if you can find some patterns and just keep to the patterns. The patterns may be very misleading. It yes. takes uh, something like, we can't count on human intelligence, but at least it's a possibility that it can abort decisions that are made just reflexively without thought. These systems have no thought, remember, they're just, yeah. and that's extremely dangerous. Same with the weapon systems. Definitely. I mean, uh, drone technology is supposed to be very precise until you look at the casualties. And in fact, there's a further question about, say, drone technology. It's very, it's reasonably affected at murdering people who you don't like. Should we be murdering people we don't like? I mean, what about that question? Uh, I mean, suppose that, say, Iran was uh, sending drones around the world to assassinate people who intend to like war Iran. Yeah. Kill everybody in the American government and the Israeli government. Do we think that's okay? Well, if it's not okay for them, why is it okay for us? Go back to Kant. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And, uh, and, and, and on a lighter note, um, I would like to uh, to ask you uh, a question about about Mindshop, right? The, this this knowledge society um, that are watching us right now, uh, well, that will watch us <laughs> when they see the, this video. So, I think many people today uh, really don't time don't take time to tend to those trees that take uh, thousands of years to grow. You know that those those institutions and those uh, uh, those. Uh, societies that will take a long time you know so moreover uh, as, as you actually mentioned on, on the beginning of this of this interview that many people have gotten in trouble by studying and, and teaching philosophy across the years so my question is on this context uh, how can we as a society as a knowledge society make a significant and permanent impact in the world without sharing the fate of socrates and and also uh, without being intervened by uh, you know private agendas and political agendas, because I suppose that's how knowledge should be. It should be free. It should be without any other, you know, puppeteers behind it on the, uh, how could we do this across, across the years? A couple of levels on which we can do it. First of all, we should recognize that the struggles of people who have fought against power and domination, people like those we mentioned, Emil Zola, for example, Martin Luther King, lots of others, lots of people whose names we don't know, people on the front line. And when we think about the civil rights movement, just as I did a second ago, the name that pops into mind is Martin Luther King. Yes. Very important individual, courageous, honorable individual. He wasn't on the front line. I don't know the names of the people who were I don't know the names of the SNCC workers who were riding the freedom buses to try to encourage black farmers to face the threat of lynching in order to push a lever. I know some of their names, not most of them, and that's history. People are really doing things mostly we don't know. But uh, uh, over the years, centuries, they have expanded the space of possible free action. We can do things that you couldn't do 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Not everybody, people like us who are fairly privileged, we have a fair scope, not everybody, not a black kid in the ghetto, but we have. Okay, that's one of the ways in which we can do things. 
It's a lot easier than it was because of the legacy we enjoy of people who fought, didn't give up and struggled. Uh, the other way, which is from another perspective, is to eliminate the concentrations of power. As long as they exist, they're going to work for their own benefit. Not a new insight. And go back to Adam Smith, who we're supposed to worship, but not read. But if we bother to read him, uh, what he said is, the masters of the universe, the masters of mankind, his phrase, are in his day, the merchants and manufacturers of England. And they are the principal architects of policy, government policy. And they manipulate it to serve their own interests. No matter how grievous the impact on the people of England and the people abroad who suffer the savage injustice of the Europeans. And that's a pretty good lesson. Uh, that's what's going to happen. Doesn't matter whether the concentration of power is public or private. There's a kind of a myth that we live by that if concentrations of power are private, it's not a problem. It's the government that's the problem. First of all, total nonsense. Secondly, Adam Smith is right. The private power is the force that controls the government. They are the principal architects of policy. Overwhelmingly, not 100%, but to an extraordinary extent. So as long as there are concentrations of power, you're going to have the problem you described. They're going to use it whatever power, excessive power they have to try to protect themselves. And, and the, if it happens to harm others, that's incidental. That's almost, almost an automatic consequence, a very close to automatic consequence of simply maldistribution of power, which can be of many kinds. And so the, the main goal is to try to overcome that. We'll go back to the philosophy of the new nationalism in Latin America that the US had to crush by force uh, was committed to trying to obtain equality of rights and, distribu and in distribution of resources. That's a heresy. Can't allow that. Have to maintain concentrations of power. And if you look for critics of this, there are very few. Definitely, definitely. Uh, um, as I've put it, when uh, when I when I talk uh, with my brother on, on on our critical thinking podcast, uh, I, I I mentioned that I mean they're they're the ones that own the doors and they own the keys. So there's really not a lot to to do in that sense. Well, anyways, uh, as a final question, just one one last one uh, uh, as we as we come towards the end of this of this talk. Uh, if you could give one message to people across time, because as I mentioned, uh, my vision for our knowledge society is to outlive us all, to live, uh, to to become uh, truly a, a a power across the ages, uh, a society of knowledge across the ages that that looks for uh, for constructive uh, movements, uh, human rights movements, etc. Uh, what message would you give to people uh, uh, if they could do? a few things in order to to keep going on, on this direction you know just just like one last message for the for the society as as people well right now there happens to be a very special unique message i mean people of your age your generation have a challenge to face that has never arisen in human history never yesterday the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists released its latest. They have an annual analysis of the world security situation. It's, it's kind of encapsulated in the doomsday clock. I mean, it had a certain distance from midnight, which is termination, extermination of the species. It's now set at 100 seconds to midnight. It's the closest it's ever been. They abandoned minutes. That was during the Trump administration. We were wondering, everyone was wondering to see if they would move it yesterday. They didn't, they kept it there. I said, one, malignancy is gone. Trump is out, at least temporarily. 
but other problems have worsened. Now, going back to your generation, you have to decide whether the human experiment will continue and quickly. You mentioned environmental catastrophe. That's one deep problem. Cannot be delayed. It's the next couple of decades are going to decide whether we've overcome the problem or whether it's often running out of our control. Uh, another is nuclear war. Threats are increasing severely, don't have a lot of time. We know there's some good moves like the uh, couple last Friday, the, uh, a tre the international treaty on prohibition of nuclear weapons came into effect. 50 nations ratified it. None of the 122 agree with it. None of the nuclear powers. That has to change. They have to be brought into compliance with the, actually with their own commitments under the Non-Proliferation Treaty to put in good faith efforts to try to eliminate nuclear weapons. If we don't, we're Oops. in very serious trouble. In fact, probably finished. So these are all things that have to be done right now, not a lot of time, and the stakes cannot be higher. It's not just whether human society will survive, but other species on earth, other species on earth, which we're killing at an incredible rate, simply cannot go on. Uh, it's, uh, you know, when Greta Thunberg steps up and talks to the older generation and say, you betrayed us, she's right. It's a shocking betrayal, but you're left with the ruins and you have to see what you can do with them. So there's no message in human history that's more important than that. Okay. Well, Professor, I, I can't really put into words my, 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 my feelings right now. I'm, I'm really, really glad we, we had this conversation. I feel extremely lucky to get a chance to, to talk to you in, 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 this, in this way. And I agree with you, we are very privileged in, in many ways. And uh, thanks for your time. I, I really, really respect your work, everything you have done, uh, both in linguistics and of course in analytic philosophy, and of course in your activism in, as your hobbies, as you, as you mentioned, I, I, perhaps that's the most yeah. important of everything. <laughs> uh, it's great, it's great. Thanks very much, very good to talk to you. <laughs> Very good to talk to you too. Great meeting you. Have a nice day.